Okay, good morning. My name is Pastor Lewis. I'm the part-time interim here at Chinese Community Church. Welcome to our Sunday worship service. Let's, just be, let's all stand as we begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> let's pray. Father God, thanks again for another uh, beautiful day and the opportunity to gather for worship. Thank you for every person that's here in person, as well as those joining online later. And we pray that you'll prepare our hearts to be open to the opportunity uh, to worship you with our praises, um, our, just our appreciation and grateful hearts and lives for all of your love and your blessing to us. Uh, thank you for Carol leading worship this morning. Uh, thank you for um, just the opportunity to look in your word and to also prepare our hearts for communion later during the service. So, Father, we commit the entire morning to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Yes. Great. Super. If you have not already done so, we would deeply appreciate it if you could silence your cell phones. Uh, that would be great. Uh, do we have any first-time guests with us? I think we have a couple. Uh, is it Dan and Agnes? If you could just stand real quickly. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, let's see. Let's... Okay, Dan and Agnes, this is just a little gift bag on, on behalf of the church we always give to our first-time guests, so thanks so much for being with us. Uh, this is the first Sunday of the month, so if we could just pause and maybe acknowledge any birthdays or anniversaries the month of S September. You could just stand and say your first name and uh, what day uh, is your birthday or anniversary. I know Eddie's birthday is... Okay, thanks, Eddie. Uh, September 11th. All right, any other? Yeah, Terry? My birthday is September 9th. I will be 79 years old. Wow. Fantastic. Sure. Okay, we're all looking. Fantastic. We're all looking forward to next year to be invited to your big 80th banquet. <laughs> so, inviting ourselves. Okay. Um, all right. Any other birthdays, anniversaries in September? Okay, Randy. Super. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. Super. All right. Any other birthdays, anniversaries in September? Uh, Matt. Matt. Oh, great. I know you practiced for that. Okay, so September 15th, how many years? <laughs> how, how many? 41? 21. Wow, they got one of those children matched wedding things, okay. 21. <laughs> okay, is that right, May? I just check in. Okay, I want to get the right answer. Okay, great. <laughs> Any other birthdays, anniversaries in September? Okay, that's it for September. All right, well, happy birthday and happy anniversaries. Um, today uh, is the final Sunday that uh, Pastor Johnston and his wife Sandra will be with us and PJ's mother uh, as well. Um, Pastor Johnston and Sandra are moving back to Canada, uh, so we will have a special presentation uh, later in the service, and we want to have a time of prayer for them as well. <clears throat> but there's also a, a special cake, you know, one of those Costco sheet cakes, that uh, we'd like you to join with us on, on your way out. You can have the uh, usual little snacks on the table, but if you can come back to the Fellowship Center, uh, we'll have some cake uh, as well to um, uh, wish them our best and uh, send them off with our prayers and our appreciation. Okay? Uh, just a reminder that... Um,
beginning to bring the little props up here. Uh, this is the uh, new book that the men will be studying probably in a month, month and a half in our men's fellowship, Bible fel study fellowship. It's uh, by Max Lucado. It's a commentary on Colossians, <clears throat> excuse me, Colossians and Philemon. Now, uh, this is for everybody, um, even if you're not going to join us with the men's uh, Bible study fellowship, because uh, I may end up doing a little sermon series through Colossians and Philemon in a few months anyway. Uh, so these are available for just $5. Um, see me after the service, okay? If you look at your printed uh, announcements in the bulletin, or for some of you, you're using the, the new e-bulletin on your phones. That's terrific. Uh, just number three, just a reminder that the um, ACC 50th anniversary walk is coming up a couple of Saturdays from now, and uh, uh, even though it's closed for res uh, reservations for the... Um, uh, registrations for the <clears throat> people actually walking. You can still give donations online all the way up to the uh, September 17th. Uh, so if you do give a donation, though, please make sure you do it under the uh, CCC team uh, because, um, you know, we, uh, I think we're, we're not quite in the top 10 yet, but we would like to crack that top 10 as far as total donations. We're close. So uh, if you, if you're familiar with the Programs of ACC, many of us in our church family have benefited, um, including ourselves, uh, with my wife's parents for many years, uh, really benefited from many of their programs. Number four, uh, good news, the CCC basketball program is trying to gear up and registration will take place um, on uh, September 19th. And so be praying that uh, so far the response has been very positive from families. Uh, they really would like to have their children involved again in this terrific program. And then finally, number five, uh, the Pickleball Fellowship that began uh, this past month, uh, just very successful. Every week is pretty much packed out. Uh, really appreciate Patty and others who made that possible. They're taking September off, but hope, hope to gear back up again in October. So please continue to let friends and family know about that. Uh, I just quickly mentioned that um, uh, King's tickets will be available. I, you know, I, in past years, I would get these great deals, group tickets, and so uh, I've again been contacted by the Kings and got some tremendous deals even for opening night. So you'll see more information about that in the weekly mass email update. So look for that this coming week. All right, thanks. Uh, Carol? Good morning. Welcome to CCC Worship. The first song we're going to sing is Open the Eyes of My Heart. is living hope.
stand.
let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the time for workshops. We pray for those who are traveling, who, those who are dealing with cl extreme climate change. We pray for the West Coast dealing with this extreme heat. Keep us safe and healthy. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Beautiful, beautiful spirit in this, in this church here. So today I'll be reading from James chapter 4 and verses 11 and 12. Starting with verse 11. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy, but you, who, who are you to judge your neighbor? May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. You have your bulletins, whether printed or electronic. Um, you can turn to the sermon outline that's included there, and you can tell by the title, To Judge or Not to Judge. And I think um, it's fair to say that uh, uh, among, at least among American Christians, if we were to ask the question, does the Bible uh, teach us not to judge, and we said, um, does the Bible say not to judge ever? Just, you know, we should never judge uh, in another person. I think at least 95% of Christians would answer in the affirmative. Um, but today, I hope that we'll see that generally that is definitely true because the Bible does teach us not to judge. It's very clear in some of the passages we're looking at today. But it's also clear that under certain circumstances, uh, not only uh, is it okay uh, to judge, but we are actually told that we need to judge. Now, it's just obviously it's a matter of what that means to judge, um, but we're going to look at three kinds of wrong judging that we're all pretty familiar with. But then the last point, the point number two in the outline, there's actually a right kind of judging. And maybe it, it's better if we use the term discerning rather than judging, because I think in the English language, our concept of judging other people uh, just sounds so incredibly negative um, that it's hard for us to understand that maybe there's a situation where actually uh, judgment is required and necessary, but with the right spirit and the right uh, attitude and circumstances. Okay, let's just begin with a word of prayer, and if you have something to write with, you can fill in the blanks as we go along. Okay, let's pray together. Father God, again, we thank you for the time to worship. Thank you so much for our brothers and sisters who lead us into your presence, and thank you again for every person who's here today and for those who might be listening online later. Again, our hearts, we ask that our hearts would be open to you and your word, your spirit, to one another. And Father, this topic today might be a little difficult for some of us to understand and certainly to apply, but again, we pray that we'll be uh, teachable and open again to your word and to your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now the word judge, uh, from the original language, at least in the New Testament, has this concept of sifting or dividing. It basically means we try to reach a decision on something, and I think about when every time I'm shopping for produce at a grocery store, a large market, especially fruit, you know, I'm kind of going through, like apples, I'm kind of going through the big pile there trying to find the ones that aren't bruised and the ones that look like they'd be better before I buy it. 
and uh, certain other fruit, you know, you try to give it a little sniff or you, you know, you have, we all have our way of trying to determine what we think will be the best uh, fruit to buy. Uh, in a sense, that's kind of this sifting, this decision-making process about judgment. Uh, it's a decision that requires a level of discernment and examination. Now, the context in Matthew chapter 7, actually, if we could turn uh, to Matthew chapter 7, uh, verses 1 to 5. Okay, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 5. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, that'd be great to follow along. And um, if you're taking notes, again, the first blank to fill in, the point number one, is that the wrong kind of judging uh, is clearly presented in the scriptures, and there's at least three different reasons why we can be uh, guilty of uh, the wrong kind of judging. But the first kind in capital A in your outline is hypocrisy, and we're going to see that in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 5. If we could bring up that passage, please. Great, thank you. So Jesus says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you The measure you, I think it's, what the, the, yeah, it's, yeah, the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention uh, to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, it's interesting, that passage, I think many of us are familiar with this passage. Uh, you, you notice at the end there where it says, we can help our brother to remove, remove the speck out of their eye. So, I mean, obviously there's going to be some interaction with another person where it's not just looking at ourselves, although it always begins there. And it's interesting because that terminology, the speck or the plank, um, some people think, well, does that mean we have, uh, you know, the other person has a little bit of a problem with some sin, and we have this huge problem with the same area. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean magnitude of the sin. It's not like that person has a problem with lust once in a while, and we're totally addicted to pornography. Uh, what it does mean is, is that the speck that's in our own eye because it's so much closer, and I think all of us understand this physically, you know, when we have a little speck in our eye, sometimes it can look huge because it's so close to us. It's right in our own eye. And so that, that's really what the uh, metaphor here is, is that it doesn't mean the magnitude of the sin is that much bigger in our own life. It just means it's close in our own lives. We should be able to see it that much more clearly. It should be like a plank. You know, it's huge in our, in our own vision. Whereas our brother or sister, you know, has a, a speck, meaning they have something in their life that needs correction, but that's in their life. And so just by, in terms of uh, perspective and reference, it should be much bigger and much clearer to us in our own lives. So we need to take care of that first before we can see clearly enough to be used by God to graciously and lovingly help the brother or sister see that speck in their own eye. Okay, so it doesn't mean judging, not to judge others doesn't mean we never say anything to anyone else or never get involved in something that may need correction in somebody else's life. It just means, first of all, let's not be a hypocrite. Now, the hypocrite is kind of an interesting word, right? Because I think most of us think about this passage in terms of saying, before I would ever s criticize or, or comment on something that's wrong in somebody else's life, I need to make sure it's not true in my own life. Now, that, that's a sense of inconsistency or the, the hypocrisy. But in the, in the context of Matthew 7, actually, if you go back a chapter, we're not going to turn to all those verses, but let me just read a couple of, uh, for you because it gives a context about this sense of hypocrisy. Because in the, in the original language, the word hypocrisy is kind of an interesting word. It just uh, has a sense of, like, acting acting, pretending to be something we are not. And um, Jesus had a lot to say about hypocrisy in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was teaching his followers not to be like the religious hypocrites of the day. 
And by the way, I, and if you've been around a while and heard me preach before, you know that I will mention on occasions that there was only one group of people that during the earthly ministry of Jesus that he ever spoke to really harshly without this tenderness and mercy and love that characterized every aspect of his being and his life. Only one group of people he spoke to harshly. And as a matter of fact, if you remember what happened when he cleansed the temple, it wasn't just words. They were actions that almost looked violent. I mean, he was overturning tables. He looked basically, if you didn't know what he was doing or who he was, you, you think the guy was crazy. Um, because it wasn't, again, just his words of speaking harshly. Um, he was so enraged at this one particular group of people. And who were they? They were not the prostitutes. They were not the tax collectors who at that time, in terms of social standing and the latter, they were at the bottom rung. It was the religious hypocrites of the day. They were the ones that enraged Jesus the most. And so in Matthew chapter 6, when he's telling uh, his followers, you know, just uh, like in, for instance, in verse 5, it says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. In other words, their sense of righteousness was a big show. It was to impress everybody else so that everybody else would think, oh, how holy, how spiritual that person is. They were basically like acting. So that's the kind of hypocrisy that existed among the, these um, religious leaders. Now, not all of them, but primarily as a group, that, that was the characteristic. But it wasn't just seen in, um, in, as a matter of fact, in the whole gospel of Matthew, uh, Jesus refers to hypocrites like 12 times in, in different parts and uh, in different sections of the, of the gospel. But, um, and so if you actually, um, like in verse, uh, six, uh, see, verse 16 of Matthew 6, uh, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Again, the external show, they're acting. And what are they acting like? They're trying to act like they're holy, holier, we've all heard the term, holier than thou. You know, it's the idea that they want to basically put themselves up on this pedestal. And, and the, the greatest act of hypocrisy by these religious leaders were the ones who openly attacked and criticized Jesus himself. Now, you think about it. This is the epitome of hypocrisy. Not only is it guilty, are they guilty of these things themselves, but they were going through this whole life characteristic of acting and pretending to be so holy, holier than other people. And, you know, when we do that once in a while to other people, I mean, uh, you know, that's wrong, definitely, but at least we're doing it with another person. If we do it with Jesus, you know, ho holier than Jesus. Um, is, so that's why I think uh, in terms of Jesus' response to this group of people, speaking very harshly to them, he was enraged at the cleansing of the temple, overturning tables, looking like a crazy person. Because the righteous indignation um, in his response to these religious hypocrites. And sometimes people wonder, well, if Jesus came back today, you know, if he were here with us today in church, what group of people would he be most angry with? And again, it is not the people that in, in our social standing of things and our moral sense of what's right and wrong. It's not the group of people that we necessarily tend to think about. It's religious hypocrites again, those who pretend that they are spiritual and holy uh, when they have all kinds of issues going on in themselves and those who would even question the authority of Jesus and uh, who he is. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. He's the Lord of Lords. It would be like, you know, today if, um, if, if I were criticizing someone like Mother Teresa for caring for the poor. I'd be like, really? You know, you're going to question Mother Teresa about, you're going to criticize her lack of caring for the poor? Me? You know, it's like, wow. Or, or criticizing someone like Billy Graham for being more faithful and sharing the gospel. It's like, oh, come on. Who are you? You know, it's like, but to act for these religious leaders to actually attack and criticize Jesus Christ, uh, that was just totally over the top. Genuine Christ-like holiness will always be linked together with the love and humility of Jesus Christ. And so whenever we see any Christian leader, uh, and sometimes, you know, they definitely exist today, uh, where we hear them preaching and uh, 
just rebuking certain kinds of people or, or certain kinds of sins, and they seem so angry. And they're, you know, just like in attack mode. Um, and we don't see any sense of humility or any sense of the grace and the mercy and the compassion of God. These things all go together. It's not one or the other. It's not righteousness and holiness or grace, love, and mercy. They are combined together in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to um, always remember in our own Christian lives. Uh, like it says, in a, you know, we're not going to turn there, but Ephesians chapter 4, if you say, well, how do we measure if we're growing as growing more mature and committed in our spiritual lives? What does that look like? Well, externally, you say, well, it's just, you come to church more often, you read your Bible, you, know, you, you get involved in Christian ministry, and those are all great things. But in Ephesians 4, it talks about becoming more like Jesus in the sense of more consistently living out the truth of God in the grace and love of God. And if you compare that with John chapter 1, you realize, oh, that, well, that's Jesus. Now, that's becoming more like Jesus, to more consistently live out and convey the truth of God, the righteousness, holiness of God, but in the love and mercy and grace of God. The two are always wedded together, combined. You can never separate the two. So that was capital A. Hypocrisy is one of the types of judging uh, that is clearly wrong. But capital B, judging as if we are the ultimate judge. Judging others as if we are the ultimate judge. In other words, like we're God himself. James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, uh, which was read earlier. We could turn there. Um, thank you. Appreciate that, Jonathan. All right. James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, us, who are we to judge our neighbor? Now, again, that's the negative kind of judging, the, con the sense of condemning as if we are the almighty judge ourselves, that kind of attitude, um, that kind of judgment is clearly wrong. So judging as hypocrites, judging as if we're the ultimate judge ourselves. Capital C, judging gray areas. Gray areas. Now, what are gray areas? Well, our lives are filled with gray areas, whether we realize it or not. Uh, people in general, whether they're Christians or religious at all or whatever, they, they face gray decisions all the time. I think one of the simplest examples that relates to some of us because we're into sports. You know, if you ever attend a sporting event, and as I mentioned before, I've got some Kings tickets, and, you know, there's lower level seats and there's upper level seats. And, of course, the lower level seats are more expensive. Well, I've been with certain Christian friends over the years at various sporting events, whether it's a basketball game, baseball game, football game, whatever. And here's a question. I think we've all heard the term, was it called, um, uh, is it called seat hopping? Seat hopping, it's where, uh, especially near the end of the game, if a lot of the fans have left, you know, maybe the home team's getting blown out or whatever, so, you know, a lot of the home team fans leave. So if you got an upper level seat, and you figure, you know, there's so many empty seats down now in the lower section, uh, it must be okay if I come down there and maybe just, you know, kind of, give myself a little promotion in terms of seating. And, uh, and for me, uh, you know, I, I've, I've never felt like that was a big deal. I mean, as long as the usher or somebody doesn't say, hey, you know, you really, sh let me see your ticket, whatever. You know, if they don't care, then, um, yeah, I'm going to get a better seat. Now, I've been with Christian friends who had very firm personal convictions that that was wrong. They said, it's kind of like you're stealing. You didn't pay for that better seat. You really shouldn't sit down in that section. He says it's okay to move within the same price section. You know, he'll, he'll move close. No, I mean, okay, that sounds a little funny, but I, at least I, I respect him for, you know, being consistent. So I'm, when I'm with him, uh, I try not to violate his conscience, you know, and just say, well, you know, forget you. I'm going to go down lower. You know, I just, I, I'll stick with him and just not bring it up. But uh, most of us say, yeah, that's, that's not a big, that's a gray area, by the way. Okay, it's a gray area in the sense that uh, it, unless, of course, 
<laughs> an usher is asking you to move and you keep sneaking around or whatever, I think now you're uh, clearly violating the authority structure within that particular team. So, uh, but if they don't care, then, you know, I'm going to move to a better seat. Now, that, those are gray areas, and there's lots of them. There's lots of gray areas, even within the church, even within the Christian community. Uh, and uh, it, it's true in every generation of Christians for the last 2,000 years. They just have different issues. I remember when um, I was in college a long, long time ago, in the early 70s, uh, going to a uh, kind of an ultra-conservative church, and some of the issues that were really gray areas that they treated as if they were black and white were things like the length of hair for guys. You know, if you had longer hair somehow, you know, you weren't being as spiritual and you needed to cut your hair. You say, well, yeah, that's why I, uh, I seem to have, you know, kind of remembered that or something and my hair is so short now. It has nothing to do with it. My hair is real short like this because it's cheaper. It's cheaper and easier to do. I do it myself, okay? So, that, I mean, that's why... Uh, the length of hair, really? You know, uh, the way you're dressed. Now, this is something that's continued on uh, through the generations. Somehow, sometimes ultra-conservative uh, Christians believe that if you come to worship service, you should always have your very best clothes. So if you own a suit, if you own a tie, whatever, you know, that should be because you're showing more respect for God, the God that we're worshiping. Now, this church, obviously, you know, um, I remember years ago when I first came here, 12, 13 years ago, there were one or two ties. I'm really disappointed that those individuals have stopped wearing the tie. No, I'm just kidding. It's, I mean, he used to add some class you know, to our, no, it's, it, it's irrelevant, okay? It's really what is a personal issue. It's a personal choice. If you wear the tie because you personally do that to honor God, and worship, hey, more power to you. But when you start looking around and start judging everybody else who's not wearing a tie, that becomes a problem. Now, this, is, this whole thing about judging one another in, in the body of Christ, it started way back in the first century. In the first century, now you remember, you've got people coming from vastly different backgrounds coming together in one church, you know, to be brothers and sisters in Christ in this new spiritual entity that Jesus has created called the body of Christ. You've got people coming from the Jewish background, people coming from the Gentile background. And their value system and their sense of what's right and wrong uh, now in the Christian life, wow, they had all kinds of conflicts. And what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 14, and if you ever look at that whole chapter and go through it, you'll see that some of those issues involve things like meat that had been sacrificed to idols in the marketplace, you know, and maybe it was going to be cheaper. Now, uh, certain groups, if you come from more of a Gentile background and there's more of a, a problem believing in idols, the, the thought of, uh, now you're a Christian, the thought of buying meat that had been sacrificed to an idol is just abhorrent. I mean, it's like, you know, how can you do that to honor God? I don't care how cheap it is. I don't care what a great deal it is. You know, it, it's because it was sacrificed to an idol, you should not eat that meat. Whereas the Jewish Christians, you know, coming out of a Jewish background, they didn't believe in idols to begin with. They knew there was one true God from the Old Testament. And so for them, if they find meat in the market and been sacrificed to idols and it was, a, you know, 90% off or whatever, uh, I, I, now obviously if you know me a little bit, I, I would have related to that kind of perspective. I said, 90% off, are you kidding? You know, you're getting filet mignon, you know, for a dollar a pound. I don't care what they did with it or where it came from, you know. So, but now, so now how they come together in the same body of Christ and, you know, they're hosting one another for meals and things at their homes. And what if they find out that the meat that they're serving for that meal had been sacrificed to idols? And so one group of Christians would be like, how can you do this? This is so horrible. And the other's like, what's the big deal? You know, and so they had all these conflicts. And so basically what Paul is saying in Romans 14, he says a, a number of principles about how to work this out. One of the things he says, though, is don't judge one another. Because this is not an issue of black and white morality. This is not something that's right and wrong for all Christians, regardless of your backgrounds or cultural uh, you know, orientation or your personalities or your family of origin or any of those human differences. There are plenty of principles that apply to all of us. Okay, now when I came here 12, 12 13 years ago, it was interesting because you know, when, when a new pastor comes in, uh, you know, the, the members kind of try to find out, you know, <laughs> where this pastor is coming from on a number of these gray issues uh, because sometimes they don't look at them as gray issues. 
And I remember very quickly, uh, I was asked about things like drinking alcoholic beverages, you know, like a beer or a wine or champagne, or, you know, like you go to a wedding uh, ceremony and they're serving champagne. Or should, should a godly spiritual Christian uh, uh, partake in that? Or should you abstain? Because there's something intrinsically wrong with drinking any alcohol. And uh, I remember the leadership team, uh, my first meeting with them, we had monthly meetings, you know, and, and my, it was at somebody's home, and there were these bottles of wine sitting on the counter, you know, and, and some of them were looking around at each other like, uh, we should have put those away, you know. We don't know what Pastor Lewis thinks. And so they asked me about it very sort of timidly, you know, is that okay? Uh, I don't care. <laughs> I, mean, just, I mean, really, in the Bible, what, what does it say about drinking alcoholic beverages? Um, it is definitely a gray area, but there's, one, there's some very clear principles in Ephesians 5 about excess. Excess. You should not be drunk. And actually, you can apply that to any substance. Any substance abuse to be, begins to control us. That's clearly wrong for any Christian, any culture, any background. So... There's Christian liberty in terms of you want to have a beer, wine, whatever. Now, we don't do it here at the church. Um, you know, for all of our official church functions, we don't serve alcohol, not because we think it's intrinsically evil, but because we understand that people are coming from different backgrounds. And certainly in our country, we all understand alcoholism, the excess, the abuse of alcohol is, is a huge problem. And if there's some younger Christian, some Christian that comes from that kind of background, they come to, you know, come to our Bible study or come to some... A big church event, and they see us serving beer and wine and everything else. You know, it'd be like it could. What it says in Romans 14 is, "Don't be a stumbling block to one another," meaning we have freedom. But if we know that our freedom, whatever it is, it might be, seat hopping at a sporting event, you know, drinking a beer or wine, can be a spiritual hindrance, a stumbling block to another brother or sister. That I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, you know. I'm going to do without. I'm going to just uh, sacrifice that for because the love that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ is far more important than any area of personal freedom that that we might have. And so that's that's what's characterized this church family. You know, the 13 years I've been around here is I I see that kind of attitude, the the kind of concern for one another that we're not going to impose our freedoms on one another that possibly creates a hindrance or stumbling block to one another. And that's the principles, some of the things we find in Romans 14. Many other areas of gray areas, and so the question is, um, if, you know, if there is a legitimate biblical reason to judge uh, another Christian, we need to make sure it's not done out of hypocrisy, that we're not having an attitude that we are the ultimate judge, and certainly not an area that is a gray area. It needs to be crystal clear in the scriptures that something is right or wrong. Okay? That's the, where we come into uh, Roman numeral number two in your outline. And we're going to finish this kind of quickly here. But if you're taking notes, Roman numeral number, uh, number two. The right kind of judging. In 1 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 3. Actually, we'll, if we look at uh, 1 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 1, that would be helpful. The right kind of judging, okay? And we'll look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, beginning of verse 1. The Apostle Paul is addressing this situation in Corinth where the church uh, has this issue going on and they are totally mishandling it. They think they're handling it for the right reasons, but Paul basically rebukes them and says, you guys are really missing the boat on this one. Here's what he says in verse 1. It is actually reported that there is, a, there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that does not occur even among pagans, meaning unbelievers. A man has his father's wife, meaning a man in the church is having sexual relationships with his father's wife. So the implication is it's his stepmother. All right, and so let's go on. Verse 2. And you are proud. Now, you might say, well, what church would be proud that they got a, a member of their church who's engaged in this kind of sexual immorality? Well, here's the kind of perverse thinking that goes on that unfortunately is true to some extent today in some American churches. 
is where there is blatant sin going on, something that's not a gray area, but something clearly contrary to Scripture, and not only are they not addressing it, they are saying, to, basically, we are being forgiving, we are accepting, we are graciously embracing this person even in their blatant sin. And so they've gone from you know, confronting it to embracing it. And the Apostle Paul is saying, shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? Now, this is a tough topic, especially in churches here in America, because I, I think the pendulum has swung so far from you know, the righteous, holy wrath of God, you know, fire and brimstone, to this very kind of warm, fuzzy sense of God. You know, he's our friend in the sky, and he's so gracious and tender, and we can just do anything we want, and he forgives us. And so there's no discipline. There's very little or, or no discipline. And actually, what we see today, what I've seen, even in my own 40 years of ministry, is churches tend to go to one extreme or the other. I've seen some ultra-fundamentalist churches that are really big on discipline, man. They'll go after anybody for every little thing, you know, excommunicating half their membership, whatever. You know, every little thing, boom, you know, they're on top of it. Where's the grace? Where's the mercy? Where's the compassion? Where's the sense of, you know, that we're working together here to understand that God's whole purpose of discipline is not to punish people, not to kick people out because you're mad at them. It's discipline, the same kind of discipline that we have with our children. Not because we're angry, not because we want to beat them up. Whatever. It's because we want the best for them. And we know that every child needs loving discipline. And sometimes it needs to be firm, depending on their response to it. But the same thing is true spiritually and in the church. And the other extreme, of course, we have so many churches that basically coddle sin. Now, if we find out somebody's you know, living all kinds of sexual morality, then we're talking not about just... Uh, um, people who are on the fringe of the church. We're talking about active members, you know, in the core of the church. And they're engaged in this, and everybody knows about it, and then nobody wants to say anything or do anything. Why? Because they think we should never judge one another. They think only Matthew chapter 7, and they forget about this passage in 1 Corinthians 5. And by the way, uh, I'll just mention, that, and those of you who have been Christians around church a while, you know that we keep talking about how important the Bible is. And why, you know, we need to study the Bible, read the Bible, because not only every passage in its context, but Scripture with other Scriptures. And that's why if we only know one or two verses on a topic, it leads to an imbalance because we only kind of apply and live out that one or two passages. Rather, well, what about these verses over here? Because together, when we have greater um, sort of an overall understanding of the Word of God, and, and by the way, it doesn't matter if you study and read the Bible uh, faithfully every day the rest of our lives. We'll never get to the point where we know the whole Bible. I mean, I went to seminary for four years, took Greek, Hebrew, you know, the whole thing, whatever. It's like it, you barely scratch the surface. The Word of God, the Bible, is alive. It is not just a book that can be studied like literature, okay? It is the, it is, and so there's the written Word of God, there's the living Word of God, Jesus. Together they are the Word of God. But we, the better we know the Bible, even just intellectually, the greater the opportunity and, and the possibility of when we combine that with wisdom and the Spirit of God, we can address different areas of life that are complex. That You, know, you need to understand two or three different verses of the Bible in order to have a Christ-like response to that situation. So Paul's saying here, you know, this is church discipline. That person should have, been, should have come under church discipline. Not to get angry at them, not to, you know, just beat them up, but because they need the pressure, the loving pressure to, to correct this wrong behavior. And instead, not only were they not doing that, they were proud of themselves for being so loving and gracious and accepting. They were embracing this person in sin. Now later, in 2 Corinthians, if you want to look at this later, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 the Apostle Paul comes back to it, and it seems to be this particular situation he's talking about, and he's saying that person did repent. Make sure you reach out in the love of Christ. Don't keep beating this person up. Don't make them feel guilty. Or don't, you know, like you keep bringing up what you did in the past. Whatever. No. Once a person repents, we embrace them. There's, for all of us, you know, we all sin. We all have failures. When we confess and, re and repent, like in 1 John 1, 
It says God is just and, and forgives us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We've got a clean slate. You know, it's always getting back to love and to fellowship and support once we go through uh, a situation like that. Okay. Um, yeah, let me just give you a couple of quick verses if you're taking notes because we, we really need to wrap this up. Uh, but uh, if you, we're not going to look at these, <laughs> but other verses that talk about this right kind of judgment. It's got to be done with, the, with a love and with the grace and um, uh, with tenderness. As a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say that anytime there is legitimate biblical discipline being exercised, the person who's doing it, really, if you're not in tears, you ought to be close to tears because it hurts that much to have to even say that or to do something like that with another Christian who's living in sin. You know, if you're going like you're all ready for combat, you know, and you're really going to give it to them, forget it. Don't say a word. Don't do anything because you're not going to approach that person the way Jesus would. So that's just the word. But here are the passages. Matthew 18, if you're taking notes again, just jot it down. Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20, talk more about a personal uh, situation where another Christian has sinned against us. What do you do with that? How does the church possibly get involved? Matthew 18. And then Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 actually says, you know, if, if a brother or sister is in sin, then you who are uh, spirit-filled, you know, are to go and address that. And so there's, there's conditions. It's not just any Christian. Uh, generally, it's leadership, but every single brother and sister in Christ uh, has this responsibility. As a matter of fact, um, if there's something where any of us are kind of drifting in some area of our lives and, and we're getting into stuff, you know, that's clearly contrary to Scripture, it's far better if a Christian friend from the church family will go and be the first one. Not the pastor, not an elder or deacon, whatever, but someone who's really close to that person, that, who that person would say, if I had to have a, the best friend I have in this church come speak to me about something that's difficult, you know, like there's some sin in my life, then this is the person they would be. That's the person that should be going. But many times, let's face it, we're all honest. We got close friends, and if there's something like that in their life, and we see it very clearly, nobody else knows about it, whatever. We, you know, we, we sense God is kind of telling us, maybe I should say something. We're scared. I mean, you know, there's, to say something like that to a close friend may mean that person is not going to take it well, and that may mean the end of that friendship. That's a risk. And actually, if we understand what real friendship is, we know that sometimes that's what um, real friends do. They're willing to take that risk. And actually, you know, if God works it out, whatever, uh, so many times that friendship will become even closer and deeper and more meaningful once you've gone through a difficult situation like that. Okay, so I'm sorry, this has gone kind of long, but uh, the last point, again, if you're taking notes, to judge or not to judge, and that's just a simple yes. To judge or not to judge, yes, meaning depending on the circumstances, the context, sometimes we do judge. We discern. And we are the hands and the instruments of Jesus himself because we all need that, a loving confrontation at times for sin in our lives. But the vast majority of times, the answer is no. We don't judge because it's like Matthew 7. We don't want to condemn others. We're not the ultimate judge. We don't want to be hypocrites. And we certainly don't want to judge anyone for gray areas. Okay. If anyone has any questions or concerns as a result of the sermon, please let me know. Uh, I'm more than happy to discuss anything with you, clarify, uh, whatever. So let's close in prayer. And then we'll transition over to communion, okay? Let's pray. Father God, thanks again for the opportunity to worship and to study your word together. Help each and every one of us, regardless of how many times we've read the Bible or gone through it, regardless of how much we have studied the Bible, to remember um, your word is alive and it pierces to the heart for every one of us. And we need to commit our, our, ourselves for the rest of our lives as much as possible as we have opportunity to read, to study, to meditate, but most of all, to live out your word, the scriptures. And so that we might become more and more like the living word, like Jesus himself. And this area of judgment is very difficult. It's a struggle for all of us. 
But Father, help us to have the right attitude, to be like Christ, and to be gracious and gentle, patient, not to judge people wrongly, uh, but when it's necessary, to judge as you would have us, to, with discernment, and to be like Jesus, to speak the truth in love. And so, Father, uh, thank you for this time. We give you the praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as we transition into communion, um, hopefully everyone picked up one of these little cups on your way in. Uh, it's just a reminder that um, Jesus established this tradition for all of his followers that when we partake of the, um, well, at that time it was bread, in this case it's a little wafer, and we drink the little juice, it helps us remember the body and blood of Jesus himself that was sacrificed for us uh, because of God's great love for us. All of us are born separated from God because of our sin, and the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And when we take communion, it's a time for those of us who have this relationship with Christ to remember in a very significant way so that our lives, our attitudes, our actions, our values, uh, nobody's going to be perfect, but that we want to refocus because we all get distracted by things, to refocus on how much Jesus should mean to us and all that he's done for us. And that motivates every aspect of our lives, all of our relationships, every, everything that's important to us in life, it all revolves around Jesus. And so uh, if you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and you're walking into fellowship with him today, then we invite you to join us uh, with one of these little cups. Uh, if anybody needs one, um, just raise your hand real quick, and we'll make sure you get one. Anybody? Okay, everybody's set. All right, don't start peeling off the layers yet. Uh, we've gone through this ever since we reopened this last year. Uh, we take communion once a month, and we use these little cups, and it's got two layers of plastic on top. The top, the top layer is that little clear layer. Uh, we're going to peel that off in just a moment. Not yet. Okay, not yet. Just a moment. That's going to reveal the little wafer. But let me just read some verses from uh, 1 Corinthians. Th this, again, is... Um, those of you been around, you know that I, I, I tend to read this passage uh, before we take communion each month. But this is what the Apostle Paul says about communion. Okay, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and peel that top layer off carefully. If you peel off the second layer, the purple layer, you'll reveal the juice and it might spill. So just peel off that top layer very gently and carefully. It should reveal and give you access to that little wafer on top. And if we just all hold that wafer for a moment, and let's, let, let's pray together, okay? Let me pray for us. Father God, thanks so much that you have given us this tradition, this practice, this custom, this, some would call a ritual, but that these physical elements would remind us of the spiritual body and blood of Jesus Christ, that he sacrificed his life to pay for all of our sin. And that was the greatest demonstration of your love because you loved us even while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. And so as we partake this little wafer, remind us of who Jesus is and all that he has done for us, that you might be honored and glorified through it all. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together. Okay, now very carefully, if you could peel back that second layer, the purple layer. I say carefully because once it's peeled back a little bit, it'll reveal the juice and it can spill very easily. So just pull it off very slowly and gently. 
You don't have to pull it all the way off, but maybe at least halfway so that you can have access to the juice. Now again, this is juice. It, in the early days, uh, and in some Christian circles today, they use real wine still. But um, this is juice. The symbol itself doesn't matter that much. It's what it represents. It represents the, bl the blood of Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us the, the life is in the blood. So Jesus sacrificed his life for us. So let's partake together. <clears throat> okay, let's pray. Father God, thanks again for the tangible symbol that reminds us that Jesus sacrificed his life for us as a demonstration of how much you love us and that that love, the supernatural, infinite, unconditional love of God would motivate us every day of our lives. We all have choices every day, things that are important to us. And our lives are filled with many good things, things you've blessed us with, work, families, friends, um, things. But Father, I pray that none of those things would replace what is best at the center of our lives, of our hearts, and the throne of our lives would be Jesus himself. And so Father, thank you for this time. We give you all the praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're transitioning again in the service uh, to the prayers. We have an offering prayer and then the pastoral prayer. Uh, let's just, let me just uh, lead us in the offering prayer at this time. We don't pass a plate because of COVID, but there is a basket uh, by the front door on your way out. If you want to give tithes and offerings, feel free as God leads you. Okay, and just a reminder again that we are collecting a love offering for our sister Melanie. Uh, if you want to give above your tithes and uh, offerings, just write the check to CCC and put on the memo line either love or put Melanie's name. And 100% of those proceeds will go to Melanie, okay? Let's pray. Father God, thanks again for um, uh, just how you bless us in so many ways. Uh, we have been blessed abundantly, especially living here in America. We often take it for granted. But some of us uh, perhaps either were not born here or we have parents or grandparents who were immigrants and we're reminded of how blessed we are uh, in many ways, but materially and financially. And Father, I'm so thankful for the brothers and sisters who have continued to give uh, sacrificially, faithfully, even during COVID, uh, not only um, now that we're open again for worship, but even um, while we were shut down, they've continued to mail in their tithes and offerings. And we pray again for wisdom um, as the leadership uh, it desires to be good stewards of what you've placed at our disposal uh, for the needs of the church, but also the needs of the community and the world through our, our missionary efforts. And so, Father, we thank you again for the offering and commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastoral prayer. Okay, just join with me as I lead us in pastoral prayer at this time. Okay. Oh, before I, I pray, though, I, you know, once in a while, we and I probably should do this more often, but, you know, there's a prayer request that I think would be good to encourage the whole church family to be, to be praying about together. And it's no secret, I think we're all aware that we live in a country now that is so divided, uh, especially by politics. And uh, the 13 years I've been here, you, you may recall 13 years ago, I started, President Obama was the president. Then we've had President Trump, now we have President Biden. And so, of course, everyone has their own opinions and perspectives, and that's fine. But as a church family, we desire to keep our focus on Jesus Christ. And once in a while, some people say some things, and I try to remind them, okay, you know, let's just check that at the door, uh, because we are the body of Christ here. We don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican, whatever. Uh, we need to be focused on God and how God uses Christians to be salt and light, but also that we are supposed to be peacemakers. If there's any group of American, uh, Americans who ought to be doing more to really kind of lower the rhetoric and lower the tension that exists, it ought to be Bible-believing Christians who desire to honor God and Jesus Christ. But sometimes we're part of the problem. So let's just have a moment of silent prayer before I lead us in pastoral prayer and just pray for our nation, 
Pray for our leaders, regardless of what political party. And pray for ourselves that as Christians, we would be more careful and sensitive about conversations that we get into with people. We can have our own opinions. Who we vote for is our own business. That's fine. But when it comes to being a peacemaker, you know, let's not add to the heat. You know, let's try to generate more light than heat and try to, again, to live out the gospel uh, as our church vision statement, to better experience and share God's love. And to remember that's first and foremost in every situation we find ourselves in, okay? So let's just pause for a moment at 30 seconds of silent prayer. Pray for our nation, pray for our leaders, pray for ourselves, that we can be more part of the, the solution than part of the problem. Okay, let's pray. Our Father God, we um, are blessed to be living in this great country, this great nation that you have blessed so mightily over the centuries. But Father, we're very concerned about the state of our nation, and um, we know that it's very, very divided, perhaps more divided now than it's been since almost since the Civil War. And Father, I pray that as Christians in this nation, regardless of our own political uh, affiliation or our own political persuasions, that we would keep first and foremost uh, our relationship with you and the, the life of Jesus Christ, that his love, his grace, his holiness needs to be seen in and through our own lives. And in our, especially in our interactions with those outside the church, to not add to the heat and the conflicts, but to be very careful and to be gracious in our speech. Speak the truth, your truth and your love always. And Father, thank you again for uh, the confidence we can have that no matter what's going on and the problems, the challenges that our nation may face, that ultimately you're still on the throne and our allegiance is ultimately to you. But Father, we do pray for our leaders on both sides of the aisle, whatever po political party they are a part of, that especially for those who profess to know you as personal Lord and Savior. Father, may they be challenged in their hearts uh, to recognize um, that they need to be more part of the solution than the problem. But we do pray for each one. We know that many of them are under uh, tremendous pressure and, and have great responsibilities. So we lift them up before you, as you have told us to do. And we pray for ourselves, again, that we would be uh, agents of your love and grace in every aspect of our being. So, Father, we commit all this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I am sorry for going a little over, but we do have a special uh, prayer to, uh, today because today is the last Sunday for Pastor Johnston and his wife, Sandra. They are moving back to Canada. Uh, and um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a cake uh, that we'd like to just share with everyone Afterwards, if you can stay for a few minutes, we'll be in the fellowship hall. But this time, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Johnson and Sandra, you want, and Pastor Johnson's mother is going to also come up. Um, and I'm going to ask the current, uh, the present consistory members to come up and join me as we pray for them. Uh, I think that's uh, Randy, Tom, Stan, uh, I know some, May, yeah, some of the others are out of town. But if you could come join with, with me, let's, let's all mask up. Come up here, right up to here on the stage, please. Okay. Pastor Johnston has uh, served as a guest preacher here a number of times this past year. Uh, he's been uh, taking a one-year chaplaincy program. Uh, I think it's a conjunction with UC Davis Hospital, and he's completed that program, and so actually that's why they're, they're returning to Canada and um, uh, moving, I think, in just a couple of weeks, but um, this will be their last Sunday with us. So, and Sandra's been working as our 
part-time church admin assistant. And she's been doing a wonderful job. Uh, not very many hours, but just, just tremendous help uh, to our main church admin, who is uh, Alan Lomboy, who, of course, we've deeply appreciated for many years. So Sandra's been on board for several months, and we're going to really miss her. Uh, but uh, we wanted to give this gift on behalf of the church to Pastor Johnston and Sandra. And at this time, we could gather around them, uh, the leadership up here, and just place a hand on them as I lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, thanks so much for blessing this church with individuals uh, who you bring to us. And they are a blessing to us in many different ways. Pastor Johnston, who has been a guest preacher in this pulpit uh, many times this past year, for his wife, Sandra, who's worked so diligently and effectively as a part-time church admin assistant. And together, as they uh, move back to Canada, we pray for your greatest blessing upon them and whatever ministry you have for them in the future. And for uh, Pastor Johnston's mother, uh, who's going to be moving in with other family members, uh, and we just pray that you'll help that transition to go smoothly. Thank you that uh, Pastor Johnson's mother has been a blessing to us as well in attending here at CCC. So, Father, again, we th we're so thankful for this couple, this family, and we pray that uh, you'll watch over them as they make this physical move back to Canada. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, because of time, I'm just going to close in prayer. That's okay. And again, we invite everyone to uh, pick up some of the individually wrapped snacks on a table right outside the door on your way out. But also, if you have a couple extra minutes, join us back in our fellowship center, our gym, uh, where we'll have the cake uh, in honor of uh, Pastor Johnson and his wife, Sandra. Okay, so let's, let's just close in prayer. Father God, thanks again for this day of worship. Uh, again, we're so thankful for uh, this privilege um, and this, um, the uh, freedom that you give us. And thank you, Father, that we can remember to pray for all those who are not uh, with us, who are uh, currently in, uh, in person with us because of various physical challenges. Some have COVID or are recovering from COVID, others in the hospital. Again, we pray for your healing hand upon each one. Uh, in a sense that each will experience your presence and your comfort and assurance. And for whatever needs may exist among uh, each of our church family, uh, we pray that uh, they can find comfort and assurance in knowing that you will provide in your own way and your own timing. And so, Father, thanks again. Uh, thank you that uh, we could honor Pastor Johnston and his wife Sandra and just express our appreciation to them and uh, asking again for your richest blessing upon their lives as they move back to Canada. And so, Father, dismiss us now with your blessing. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>